Thank you, James. I'd like you to concentrate on the uh, picture on the right of the screen there. It's a previously un, um, un, unpublished uh, representation of the IPCC in planning mode. <laughs> it doesn't matter which staircase you go up, it leads nowhere. And every corridor you go along ends at a blank wall or by standing upside down. Now, this whole thing is, starts with the radical green environmentalists. And their whole modus operandi is based on two things. The first is lies. Oh, sorry. And we see here, uh, I've just chosen Sierra Club. It could have been World Wildlife Fund or um, Greenpeace. We see here one of their typical glossy brochures, and it starts with a statement, naysayers declare that global warming is not real. That's an imaginary statement, it's a lie. Secondly, the big oil companies want you to believe drilling is ecologically sensitive areas uh, will not affect the wildlife that lives there. That's a second lie. So the whole basis for these scares, they constantly pick these emotional things uh, and concentrate them. And this is the cover, remember, this is right up front. That's their main message. Uh, and then the second thing is no expense is spared. The amount of money that is spent on preparing these brochures is just remarkable. And that's summarized very nicely by this cartoon. <laughs> if that's what it takes, if, that, if that's what it takes, they will find the money to make it happen. Okay, starts then with the green radical environmentalists. But secondly, there is the matter of media bias. And this bias is, in a sense, more subtle uh, than we might think. There's two um, newspaper reports. This put one on about the Great Barrier Reef, and this one about a particularly hot January that occurred in New Zealand. Now, if you read the small print in here, you'll find that they don't actually mention global warming. They don't actually mention climate change. They don't have to. They've trained the audience so subliminally that just by presenting the pages this way, and we all see this day in, day out in all the news media, they give the impression we have these crises going on. By the way, this tipping point was because a certain amount of coral had been destroyed in a cyclone on the Great Barrier Reef, and just last week a scientific paper is published that shows it's now completely recovered. Okay, so we've got traduced standards of media reporting. Next, we have the indoctrination of our children. Uh, Sender Inhof described this in his, his opening address, how his granddaughter came home. Uh, we've all had that experience. Uh, this is a website in the UK which encourages children to act as climate cops and keep a book on how their parents are using electricity and when they turn the lights off and so on. You can laugh at it, but it's one of many and professionally prepared again. It costs a lot of money to do a website like this. And so what we have is the indoctrination and propagandization of children. It's going on remorselessly in schools, museums, galleries, zoos, and every public space you can think of. Next, we have contrived and corrupt markets. Um, the, this is the European emissions trading system, and this is a report that 90% of the trades uh, were corrupt in a particular year. You all know about the Chicago Carbon Exchange, which collapsed in 2010, and one of the reasons it collapsed was because uh, of corrupt trading. For the first time in 2009, I think it was, the Times published a green rich list, and, sorry, and green investors, uh, top 100 of them in 2009, $267 billion, and when you look at some of the people at the top of the list, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, um, and uh, the Google fellows somewhere just in here. A lot of these people are heavily into the media business. So the money swung in to uh, um, this green um, stuff, and we've basically got corrupt investment markets. The idea that the carbon market is in any way a real market is a joke. It's a politically contrived, corrupt market. This one, uh, United Nations, you all know about it. It's the map they produced in 2010 showing there'd be 50 million climate refugees. Uh, and by 2010, they said, uh, and there isn't a single climate refugee. There is one person in New Zealand trying to fight a court case to establish that he is the first climate refugee. <laughs> Think about this. This is the United Nations educational program. 
They quietly took it down from their website after a couple of years with no comment. This is corruption of UN agents. And you might say, oh, yawn, what's new? But, but back off a moment, back, back off. Just think, this is the United Nations and you have major agencies of the United Nations that are acting in totally unprofessional ways. They are, in fact, lying again, just like the green organisations. This is a huge problem. A faux consensus. Here's a list of the uh, much vaunted scientific societies around the world that are supposed to be the consensus for alarm on global warming. Uh, Americans in the room, pat yourself on the back because you have, have in your... Uh, b within your borders, one of the two uh, organisations that hasn't done this, and it's the American Physical Society, which has recently revisited its statement, and the other one is, in fact, the Australian Geological Society, which has revisited and withdrawn its earlier alarmist statement. But all these statements of alarm are based not on the views of the expert members of the societies involved, but on the views of a small cadre of politically active executives on the governing board or council of the organisation. It's a political consensus, it's a faux consensus, it is not a scientific consensus. Again, back off and think how serious this is. We used to trust these academies more than any other bodies in society. We now have complete politicisation of scientific academies worldwide. Uh, Jorn Lomborg recently was offered a $3 million indu inducement, uh, not personally, but to run part of his Copenhagen Consensus Centre at the University of Western Australia by the, uh, the federal government in Australia. It was an enormous eruption of protests from the staff of the University of Western Australia. About 50 staff were turned away from the meeting, uh, and it says here it was, it was like a Rolling Stones concert to be in there. <laughs> Uh, and as a result of staff pressure, the university withdrew the invitation. This is the betrayal of every value that a university stands for, and it's an appalling transgression on freedom of speech. And it's happened because of activism by the university staff themselves and students. Okay, corruption of government science. This says CSIRO, that's Australia's Sci uh, Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation. Could just as easily read NASA or NOAA or NSERC. Uh, this is the former Prime Minister and she's saying, just wondering if you guys could find some supporting evidence for man-made climate change, Cam. Well, yeah. Um, and I've, I've, I've chosen to use this as a, as a government scientist, but exactly the same is true for university-based scientists. They are basically being controlled by the, uh, the, the way in which money is being given out. So we have the intimidation and corruption of government scientific institutes and indeed of scientists more generally in the university and other sectors. Probably the most single powerful weapon they have, this is a meeting that occurred in New Zealand about two weeks ago. This is a meeting that occurred in Australia a couple of years ago. This one's organised by CSIRO again. It doesn't matter you can't read the names, or these names either. I tell you, in every case, there is not a single person on any of those lists that has an independent or balanced view on climate change. These people are all pre-selected as known warmaholics. OK, many, many of the times that Christopher Monckton's been asked to give a talk, and then behind the scenes, people beaver away to try and get him stopped from giving that talk. It is a deadly we weapon that the other side use. They will not appear on the same platform as an independent scientist to discuss any of these issues. And we see that in spades at this conference. Over the years, scores of IPCC scientists have been invited to participate. And I think I'm right, one has, uh, has, has turned up and agreed. So. We have the exclusion of differing viewpoints from public meetings and from the media. And that, I think, is the single most effective weapon the other side's got. It's deadly. Then we have the media assassination uh, of anybody that dares to criticise. And I apologise to Willie for showing these photographs. He's wounded enough already. But I just want to make the general point that uh, this isn't, you know, the, uh, the Boston Bay Beagle Hunters newsletter. This is actually the Boston Globe. And then when the story gets picked up, it's in the New York Times, and in this case, Nature. 
This is defamation of character at the highest, most public, prestigious level that you can get. And it goes on incessantly. Willie is the poster boy for it, but every scientist that's spoken up on this issue has been subjected to it. Libelous media excoriation of non-conforming scientists. Finally, attacks on sovereignty. <clears throat> the government of India so far banned 13 foreign activists of Greenpeace International from entering the country uh, be because they're viewed as a threat to national security. Good on the uh, uh, government of India. Government of Can Canada, the Royal Canadian Mountains, has done the same. I can't read the small print down here, but it says effectively uh, that the people arguing against the Keystone Pipeline uh, are endangering national security. Now stop and think about that again. There's two sovereign governments, Canada and India, and they're actually saying that Greenpeace is operating to obstruct the government of the country, basically acting in a treasonous or, or, or whatever way. This is an extremely serious charge, uh, and they wouldn't be making it if they didn't believe it were true. So we have the subversion of sovereign interest, basically, including poverty relief in third nations because we're not allowed to build coal-fired power stations there. Uh, you can't get much more serious than this. Okay. Now, that's only half. I had to cut my slides in half. I could give you another about eight um, examples of what's going on. But it gives you the, the taste, and you all knew all that anyway. All I've done is reinforce your knowledge. Famous speech given by Dwight Eisenhower in the, uh, when he, he retired from the presidency. And the key thing at the bottom is, yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you were warned, and it has happened. There's only one answer, and that answer is audit. You're well accustomed to that thought with the Office of uh, Management and Budget in the White House that deals with financial audit, but there is also a need for scientific audit agencies. Australia used to have one called Aztec, and his job was to advise government independently on major scientific and environmental issues. Um, where's it gone? Uh, this one was in Denmark, and Jorn Lomborg was appointed in 2002 to head it up. When the government changed to a right-wing government, they dissolved something like 200 environmental advisory agencies and units and put in its place this... Uh, this National Danish Environmental Advisory Unit. In the US, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a huge amount of discussion about a science court which would do the same thing. It would uh, advise, basically, as written in here, on contentious issues of science and technology. Now, this got as far as a presidential task force written up in science, but it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because it trod on the turf of virtually every powerful Washington agency. And so I can tell you the solution. The solution is proper environmental audit organizations, and good luck to you if you can convince your, your government to start one, because the last thing politicians like doing is setting up bodies that are not accountable to them, that basically can tell the politicians what to do. So it's all very well to identify the solution. It's not a matter to bring it about. Okay. Eisenhower finished his speech by saying, we pray that people of all faiths, all races, all nations may have their great human needs satisfied. That the scourges of poverty, disease, and ignorance will be made to disappear from the earth, and that in the goodness of time, people will come to live in peace. The key thing is this, the scourges of poverty, disease, and ignorance. Around here, you have an industry that is 150 years old. It has made by far the greatest contribution to lifting those uh, scourges from the billion people that one of the speakers talked about earlier than any other industry on the planet. It is, of course, the hydrocarbon industry, both coal, gas, and uh, liquid petroleum. It is an absolutely remarkable fact that the case for the huge benefit of fossil fuel technology as a means for improving mankind's uh, continues to be made by a single small-sized American think tank, and you all know who it is, you're sitting in the room organized by it. Worldwide, it is the Heartland organization that stands up and defends this. 
And this is the cover of volume three of Climate Change Reconsidered, and the whole volume is on the benefits and costs of fossil fuels. What to me is amazing is this paragraph here. In contrast to the Heartland, hydrocarbon industry leaders have signally failed to combat the dishonest demonization of their industry undertaken by eco-evangelists over the last 25 years. <laughs> COP21 in Paris, now being but a few months away, the time for continued pusillanimity is past. <laughs>